Good morning. Uh, I'm Dwight. My pronouns are he, him. Um, welcome to everyone here and in online land. Um, I guess we've been kind of doing parables lately, and uh, today is also Mennonite Conference, World Conference Day, Peace Sunday. So I suppose I should try and kind of wrangle a peace perspective from our parable today. And maybe it's also Alliteration Day as well. So here goes. Oops, wrong way. I always push the wrong button. So, so the teaser for me in this is, what do jewelry, land titles, and pottery have to do with peace? Their scriptures are short. Um, I, I pull my scriptures out of um, the Bible that my mom and dad gave me, and it's kind of just close to my heart, so this is the one I use. The other one's fine, but just it's kind of why I do this. So, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in field, when a man found it, he hid it again, and then his joy went out and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything and had, he had and bought it. Okay. So, the Greek word kingdom is, and I'm not Greek, so I'm, you know, basileia, whatever, I'm not sure, which means a kingdom, yeah, a realm, or an area or country that a king governs. Um, however, it can also denote, denote royal or kingly power, authority, dominion, a king's rule or reign, or even royal dignity. So kingdom, I don't think, resonates very well with us anymore. Um, we get the idea of a country. That kind of makes sense. That's kind of common. But personally, I like the language of a realm. To me, it's a little bit more ambiguous, uh, maybe a little bit more of mystery, and I kind of like mystery. So. How about, how about a realm of heaven with royal dignity? How about that one? I kind of like that one. How about then, how about a realm where everyone is treated as royal dignitary, as a royal dignitary? Huh. I actually kind of like that. This is kind of my own thing, but I kind of like that. And for me, it feels a little closer to a good description of, of kind of this kingdom. It's a realm where people, everyone is treated as a royal dignitary. That's kind of my translation. So Rome was a kingdom that the people in Jesus' time understood pretty well. Um, it was the power, the reign at the time, and it was kind of brutal. Um, Romans had the idea of peace, Pax Romana, I think is the statement they used, right? But it wasn't, the peace they had was kind of like this. They regarded peace not as an absence of war or peace, but as the rare situation that existed when all their opponents had been beaten down and lost the ability to resist anymore. And all were like us. This is what Rome's idea of peace were, was. Um, this is the realm that Jesus entered and this is where he taught from. And the parable about the, the treasure and the pearls um, for me, I looked at it, and it looks like it comes at the, almost, almost at the conclusion of a group of perils, parables. First, there's the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, and then comes these parables of the hidden treasure and pearl. And after that, there comes one more, the perils, parable of the net, which seems to kind of conclude this, this whole kind of section. So I kind of see this in, as in three sections. And... As I, as I think about that, the, the parable of the treasure and the pearls is kind of like this short intermission before the wrap-up. And I wonder, what is this part about? What is its purpose? And in my commentary, you know, the commentary at the bottom of your Bible, um, where you, you, know, you read that stuff when you're really confused about what it says at the top, and then after you read the stuff at the bottom, you're even more confused. So my commentary reads something like this. Huh. Jesus pauses the parables, possibly to ponder the prominence of the previous section. It's alliteration day again. But maybe the point of this parable is kind of like an exclamation mark in a paragraph before the last sentence of the paragraph. Um, Jesus might be saying, look, the things I've just said, they're really important. Kind of pay attention. So when we find this kingdom this realm of heaven where everyone is treated as royal dignitaries, we hold our stuff lightly in our hands. 
I think someone messed that picture up. Anyways, we hold that stuff lightly in our hands. There we go. The language of this parable is kind of extreme. You know, sold everything, sold all. Well, of course it is. It's a parable. It's meant to stick in our minds. It's meant to be extreme. And memories are, are stored in our mind best as pictures. Jesus paints this very vivid picture so we remember it easily. I don't really think that we're literally meant to sell everything. Although maybe, you know, we could probably have a large garage sale for most of us, uh, you know, or send a lot of our, a lot of our stuff to the, the thrift store or Village Green and we'd probably be just fine. It might be an interesting exercise for some of us. Maybe that's another sermon. But the parable makes a point. This kingdom, this realm of heaven is like a treasure of treasures. You know the question, if you had a fire in your house and you could only grab a couple of things, what would they be? Ever think about that? I mean, we've heard that, right? What would they be? As I thought about this, um, Wendy and I have, a, a, have a, a, a love story book. That's actually it. Um, we write in it every year on our anniversary. It contains our story from the time we met. There's even print-offs of the um, messages. What were they? The Kind of like messenger but it was way before that but so it was kind of like that so there's all these things of the stuff we sent back and forth to each other and 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 we read these over and you know and then every year we add to this story things we've done in the year things that were important and, and we do that you know to remember it's all kinds of stuff in there chop we chuckle at the very beginning where everything's you know just amazing and and then other things come in and there's some difficult things and there's some great things Possibly, just saying, there might be a few steamy portions in it, and it's possible. But we pause for a moment to remember these things. That book is kind of, for me, irreplaceable, and that's one of the things I would grab. It's more than just a book. It's something of you know, infinite kind of value that you can't replace. Any idea what you would grab? Ever think about that? Maybe in my commentary at the bottom of these perils will be, would be this question about this part. What is really important? So what is this really important realm of heaven where everyone gets treated as royalty? What is that? Oh, I think some of the other parables, the birth, the life, and the death of Jesus, begin to describe what this realm is like, where everyone gets treated as a, as a royal dignitary. And I was, as I was thinking about this, there might be a, you know, let's get at it a, a different way from the opposite end or the negative end of it with a bit of history which is really isn't my thing, so excuse me, sorry. But let's back up a few years to about AD 312 when we've got the Emperor Constantine. And he's kind of portrayed as one of the founding people of the spread of global Christianity. It's really broad, there's no detail in that, but I'm not the historian. But in, in, um, in Brian McLaren's book, um, Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Mohammed Cross the Road, he, he talks about this. And he, he takes it a little bit more in-depth, still just scratching the surface, though. Um, but but he, he, in this book, he has this story from the original telling of, name is Eusebius, uh, who tells a story about Constantine. And he also notes that, that Eusebius was more of a propagandist, propagandist than uh, a historian. So a short summary of, Eusebius's propaganda goes something like this. Constantine sees a cross in the light of the heavens, apparently along with his army, and that night Christ appears to him and commands him to make a likeness of that sign and use it as a safeguard in all his engagement with his enemies. So Constantine goes ahead and makes an image of a cross, and here's the explanation. A long spear overlaid with gold, formed the figure of a cross by means of a transverse bar laid over top of it. On the top of the hole was fixed a wreath of gold and precious stones, and within this, the same symbol of the Savior's name. This was carried at the head of Constantine's armies, and his saying apparently was, conquer by this. Huh. And Brian continues on. He says, are we ever encouraged to ponder what these fateful words mean? Perhaps terrorized by this, or force conversions by this, or kill by this, or expand your violent theocracy by this. Do these words trouble us? Do we ever see a shred of irony when the instrument of Roman torture and execution on which Jesus had been brutally killed is once again employed to install fear and terror, but now not merely in the, main, in the name of Rome and the emperor who was nailed to it, uh, the name of others who were nailed to it, 
but in the name of the one who was nailed to it. Huh. Brian continues. Imagine that Constantine had seen a vision of a basin and towel with the words, serve by this, or a vision of a simple table of bread with wine and reconcile like this, or a vision of the birds of the air and flowers of the field with trust like this, or a vision of Christ's outstretched arms with embrace like this, or a vision of a mother hen gathering her chicks with love like this, or a vision of a dove descending from the heavens with the words, be kind as this, but it was not so. I think Brian portrays a good picture of the kingdom of heaven in his own parable-like examples. You could put, the kingdom of heaven is like in front of all of Brian's kind of mini parables. And, and you note know, the contrast between the vision of Constantine and the Jesus parable about the treasure, the pearl. It, the difference for me is about as far as you can get apart, east to west, however you want to say that. Conquer all or sell all to get it. They're very opposing ideas. So maybe the peril of the pearls and the treasure is a statement, an exclamation mark at the end of this section, to remember what the kingdom of heaven, this realm, is not. It's not the land of place where we, we gain power for ourselves and land but, and, and destroy each other doing the same thing. Um, maybe if we, pull, if we follow the parable a bit further, it is possible that um, the treasure is actually one another. What if that would happen? What if we saw each other as the treasure? What if we held everything we had very loosely and wondered about what treasure each of us contains? Do each of us, each race, each culture, somehow contain a treasure that has worth that is irreplaceable? What difference would that have made when the Europeans met with the indigenous here? What could we have learned? What treasure would have been found? What difference would it make for me when I meet someone different than me and pause to wonder, what treasure do you hold inside of you? Instead of, how do I conquer this? And as I say that, I'm, you know, that's nice high in the pie, but I'm reminded of times when I've, you know, not done this so well, fallen short. Maybe considered somebody else wrong, or not even considered somebody at all. Um, a little while ago, uh, I was looking on Messenger for, a, little, for a, a paint sprayer to do some particular things with, and it came up. And I worked out a, a good deal for it and drove into Saskatoon, or when I was in Saskatoon, and got up to this guy's house, and out came um, some guy from the Middle East somewhere. I don't know where, but, but a really friendly guy. And so we chatted for a few minutes, and he's like, why don't you come in for a cup of tea? <coughs> hmm, well, hmm, um, no, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm, I, that's, that's fine. I was very friendly, um, but I, you know, I declined. I took my sprayer, my treasure, and disappeared with my treasure, huh? What did I miss by not having a simple cup of tea? What did I miss by not wondering about him as a treasure? I have a few stories like this, some worse, and there are a few that I'm very not proud of. Another way maybe we can look at this is, instead of getting rid of everything, is investing. The man sold, sold all he had to invest in something else. We so often think of, oh, we gotta you know, give everything away. No, how do we invest in something else? Not don't do this or don't do that, but how do we get into it? It's more like, let's shift what we have, our skills, our gifts, our abilities, to something else, a course change. And another thing I was thinking about, what if this course change doesn't have to happen instantly? Of course, in the parables, it's, you saw this, you found this, you did it. Well, it's a short parable. But what if this, in real life, this course change takes a long, slow time, a long process? I find for a lot of people, for myself too, real change is a slow process. The instant stuff doesn't tend to stick that well. It's the long, slow things that tend to change us and shape us. Anyways, for example, and I might have probably said this before, 14 years ago I met Wendy, and her way as a follower of Christ was different than mine. And at first it was like, huh, are you even a, you know, are you even a Christian, really, are you? 
And then as I got to know her a little more, something caught my interest, and more than just you know, the obvious. Um, but what motivates someone to give their coat away to a stranger? I didn't kind of make that a lot of sense to me. I, I, what? Um, and the funny thing was, in that, I realized I was missing something. There's just something, nah, I'm not quite there yet. But I didn't know what it was for sure, just something. And the parables of the, 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 the treasure and the pearl are, are kind of two of those. In the parable of the treasure, it was more like when this person found the treasure, and in the parable of the pearl, this person was seeking for a specific pearl of great value. For me, I wasn't 100% sure of what I was seeking for, so that's my story. But maybe sometimes we know what we're searching for, sometimes we don't. And of course, over the course of the next 14 years, I went through this process of holding some things less tightly, ideas about who God is, what is really important in this journey we're having, where my focus might need to be. And at times, this can be a painful kind of process, and it can be very confusing. The things that used to be certain become uncertain, and like the ground under our feet becomes unstable. But as I pondered and searched, a new way of being came to be. It was a process, and it will continue to be. Something else to consider that these parables don't address is that this process is, doesn't work really well as an individual. We, you know, some of it happens like that, but this process done in community works much better. So if you had this community that considers each person as a royal dignitary, that each of us holds the image of Christ, no matter what, that everyone is worthy and everyone is enough, no matter what. We're enough just because we are. And everybody here, and more of those apparently thousands that are out there um, on online land, um, have been part of this change in me. So it wouldn't, happen, wouldn't have happened in this way without all of us. It just wouldn't have. Um, and to me, that sounds kind of like shalom. As we do that, nothing missing, nothing broken. We need this idea of community. I, I often say, if I hadn't started this journey 14 years ago, I couldn't sit with people in my work today the way I have. No way. Uh-uh. Because I wouldn't have that heart of considering this person as a treasure in front of me. I remember one time, uh, first when I started to do the work as a counselor, it was really overwhelming. You hear really hard stories day after day, and it got to the point where I was just, this, is, this might be too much for me. And then I was sitting with somebody, couldn't tell you what said, what, what happened, but it, it dawned on me, it came across that these people aren't handing you garbage, they are handing you the treasures, the closest things to their heart that they're not allowed to tell anywhere else. Oh. Not that the work isn't, you know, it's hard, but... It's a very different way of thinking. This is treasure. This isn't junk and garbage. This is treasure. And I get to sit in that. 2 Corinthians 4. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So I really need to remember that I am just a perfectly imperfect clay jar that contains a treasure. I am. And that treasure comes from God. And maybe the other isn't really an other, but also a perfectly imperfect clay jar that contains a treasure. Sounds like shalom, nothing missing. Um, I met someone once, um, and I'll change the story a little bit, but let's say it was a man, might or may not be, that I got to talk to. And... He, um, he got very interested in, in a woman, and um, wonderful, wonderful woman. And so they got together, and they became a couple, and they were dating. And so he brings her to, to, her, to his church. Well, it didn't take very long before you're not allowed to actually be here. This, this other person was of a different faith, very, very, more in, very much more inclusive, 
a very loving faith, um, not theologically exactly the same as ours, but it had a, a lot of things that were really wonderful about it. But she got to her, to her Christian church and was chided very hardly for it. And actually there were some things they wanted to make her do. So she just kind of picked up her stuff and she, he, <laughs> and he, and he said, mm, and he kind of went over to her church that was of this other faith and they enveloped him and gathered around him and it was this just wonderful community. So I, I looked at this guy and said, so did you find Jesus in this other faith? And he smiled and said, sir did. The treasure in each of us. Um, yeah. I, I'd be curious. Um, part of this is, is, is I find frustrating is there's no, um, the way we do things is very Greek. Somebody sits here and talks and everybody else listens and I find that frustrating sometimes. We're used to it. Just curious if we can do this. Did, as, we, as I was going through this, did anything pop out for anybody or what would be your idea of your realm? What is your kingdom of heaven like? What do you think it is? What would be really important that don't forget this? Boy, it's hmm? a realm of plenty. A realm of plenty. Huh. Can you say a little bit more about that? Afraid we'll lose what we got. Yeah, okay. And so, if we believe that there's enough for everyone, we don't have to be greedy. Yeah. 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 Ye